Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Birth Talk, talking with Jody McLaughlin today. The topic is children learn what they live. So we're going to be talking about that. And we're also, I want to start off today. First, hi, Jody. How are you? Hi, I am great. Good afternoon. It is such a beautiful day. Thank you. Yeah. And, and you're on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. So we have a three hour time difference, but that's not a problem. And the sun is shining here. Anyway, uh, a topic that you and I have talked about for many years, or at least five or more years, is the sadness, I would say, that you feel that after 30 years, there hasn't been the kind of change in our culture that you would have liked to have seen in the, in the work that you've been doing over the years with your wonderful magazine, mm -hmm. The Complete Mother, mm -hmm. which went for at least almost 20 years, 1985 to 2010, uh, give or take. And anyway, uh, the work that you've done as far as encouraging breastfeeding, women to make cho choices, mothering, choices for the baby, for the family, it's for the baby. And, and meanwhile, when you make those choices, you can help create a more peaceful world. And so, you know, why haven't, why aren't individuals making this choice? What, what's in our way? What's stopping us, blocking us and all that. So we, we want to talk about that for a little while. And then we'll get into the topic that I uh, publicized. Mm -hmm. and learn where they live. So let's talk about the disappointment or the 30 years, 30 to 40 years even, uh, where we went wrong and, and maybe signs of hope, what's going well. Mm -hmm. So you well, can I after after about almost 30 years, I figured out what the problem was. OK. And it wasn't me. Oh. Um, I was speaking at a conference to a room full of obstetricians. Uh, the reason there were so many there, because this was kind of an odd conference for them, it was the um, um, APA Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health. The reason we had so many obstetricians there, it was conveniently located. It was a good time and the uh, the um, charge for their ongoing education was reasonable. So I had this room full of obstetricians. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, at a different time, I'll tell you a little bit more about how the presentation went. But after it was over, an obstetrician from California came up to me and he said, your talk was very interesting. And um, I used my props, you know, instead of. Uh, uh, what was that first one, a cow or a pig? What was that first prop? Uh, a pig. Yeah, a, a pig, because this is, this is how I learned about midwifery was through all the care that I gave our, our pigs. Okay. And um, after the presentation came up to me and said, it was very interesting. He said, it may even be true. He said, however, I can't accept it. I said, why not? And he said, because I would have to admit that everything I've been doing professionally for the last 25 years is wrong. Mm. And I said, oh, I said to him, it's hubris. Oh. And um, he kind of, and I hugged him. And I said, all this time, I thought it was me. Oh. I thought I wasn't explaining things proper, properly. But you cannot leave your paradigm because you have so much invested in it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why. Uh, and I also learned from uh, someone who is in the insurance field because I think the insurance industry has a lot to do with our poor outcomes. And um, he told me, he said, everything is working perfectly. I said, how can you say that? Mm. Because he said, if it wasn't perfectly for those who were most invested in it, it would change. I see. Like you mentioned in another talk, that when something is gained, something is lost. And it usually has to do with money and jobs. Prestige. 
prestige mm-hmm. status mm-hmm. and all that. Okay. One one doctor dramatically reduced the cesarean section rate in his hospital. He was a chief of staff by shaming doctors. Wow. And um, there was a competition to see who could get their cesarean rate down to single figures. Ooh, interesting. What part of the country was this? Uh, Montana. Montana, okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I guess shaming works, you know, if if that's part of your paradigm, you know. Maybe a competition with incentives, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's what the um, billing codes are all about. There is no incentive to have good outcomes. Mm-hmm. Every incentive is to do more, do more, do more, do everything. And then things when things don't turn out well, you can say, well, I did everything I could mm-hmm. without realizing that a lot of the things that were done, including the things that are done during prenatal care and, um, and uh, the, the labor and delivery itself, and then the postnatal care, um actually disturbs the um our ability to to be the best that we are and it also compromises the baby's ability to see normal as happiness mm. in, instead of grief or problem or, around the corner or pain or yeah and that's that's one of the reasons why I think circumcision is such. Um, well, I like to say it's an anomaly, um, but it's it's uh, standard, you know, in many areas still. And one doctor told me he said, "Well, if I don't do a circumcision, it's like leaving money on the table." Wow. You know, here's this this money that's available, and all I have to do is you know cut a little bit off of this little guy's penis, and then I get the money. So why not? Mm -hmm. Um, I had a woman tell me, this is also North Dakota and Grand Forks, and she was solicited a dozen times to have her son circumcised. Wow, I mean, that's a family choice. That's not like something- No, 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 Um, I'm way past that. It's an individual's choice. Okay. And if he wants to be circumcised, he certainly um, um, (laughs) has has the ability to, to make those arrangements. But I think circumcising someone who has such underdeveloped genitalia is bad practice anyway, because they are so tiny and the foreskin has the texture and the consistency of thick snot. Yeah. And you can't, you can't, yeah, it's just, you know, you can't get a straight cut. You can't get a decent result because, you know, if you pull at this side, start cutting, then it stretches the other way. It's like uh, cutting silk. Yeah. You know, um, you really have to stabilize it in order to get accurate cutting. And, um, and mothers need to know that many a baby boy has been botched in, in severely. Every, in- every circumcision is a botch. Agreed. Agreed. But, yeah. even but some are worse than others, correct. including amputation of the entire phallus. Mm. Well, that's tough. Anyways, hi, everybody. If you're joining us, we are talking right now with Jody first about why haven't things improved in the last 30 years? And they then- have improved for individuals. Okay. For the woman who says, oh, no, I get it. If it doesn't make sense to me, I don't have to say yes. Great. And if someone is trying to frighten me into making a decision, that's a red flag. And I'm not going to fall for it anymore. Right. It should be. And especially women who are told, well, we got to come in and do an induction. It's just better, going to be better. And women are sometimes bullied or persuaded against their instinct. So I wish women would listen to their instinct and you can stand up and say, no, you can even at the very least, at the very least, even if there's going to be an automatic cesarean at the very least, the baby should get to pick his birthday. Yeah. Because in some circles, that's a really big deal. The day that you're born Mm -hmm. and under what sign, et cetera, et cetera. And if a baby is born at the wrong time because somebody was in a hurry or didn't process their information, 
adequately, mm -hmm. that's a real disservice to the baby. It's being born outside of his time or her time. One of my friends had um, an impacted cesarean. It was a very, very stuck baby. They had to do a cesarean with forceps. Wow. His head was so stuck in her pelvis that that he, he couldn't move up and he couldn't move down. So they did a cesarean and he was pretty banged up by the time they got him out. Okay, second baby. Yeah. And she's going to have her cesarean on Thursday. Okay. And so I said, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice, even though we know you're going to have a cesarean, wouldn't it be nice if your baby at least got to pick his birthday? Yeah. Oh, she said, that's interesting. And um, I said, why don't you call the hospital, cancel your appointment for the cesarean on Thursday and tell them that you'll come in as soon as you go into labor for your cesarean. Yeah, hello. <laughs> and so she called them and they were, oh, sure, fine, no problem. Mm -hmm. And so uh, several days later, uh, she did go into labor. She went into the hospital about 1030 at night. It was right around the shift change at 11. And um, they called the doctor, Mrs. Alex is in, uh, what should we do? Oh, just keep her there, I'll section her in the morning. Uh. So they put her in a room way at the end of the hall. And, um, you know, they were, she was gonna have her cesarean first thing in the morning. And then there was a shift change and I don't know if they forgot about her or, you know, I guess it wasn't even on the chart because, you know, we don't have to do anything. She's just gonna have her section in the morning. And she rocked and she walked and she knelt and she, she, she hung from her very tall husband's shoulders. She did everything she could just to get through the night so that she could have her cesarean in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, the early morning hours found her kneeling on her bed. Okay. And the baby slid right out. Yay. And uh, the husband calls the nurse, because doctor wasn't in yet, calls the nurse and says, come quick, come quick. And there was the baby and the mom's fine. The baby's fine. Everything's fine. And um, she called the doctor and told him that the, the baby had been born and the doctor reamed her. Yeah, out. he was angry, right? You should have waited for me. No, yeah. he, 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 he was scheduled to do a cesarean and now his schedule is all screwed up. Ah, okay. And, um, and, and not only that, but who gets paid for the birth. Right. I think the hospital will find a way to get paid for the birth because it happened well, on the property. Um, it, it turns out that the person who gets paid for the birth is the one who cuts the cord. Okay. So in addition to all the other advantages that this um, uh, small little person had, she uh, had delayed cutting of the cord. Great. That was an undisturbed birth in a hospital. That's wonderful. And, and they didn't quickly uh, clamp and cut the cord because the person who cuts the cord gets the check. Yeah. And um, um, one of the things I was going to talk about was uh, the, uh, the cord cutting apparatus. Yeah. And there is a very interesting website. I believe it's called cordclamp.com. Okay. And it's a doctor. I believe he's from the upper Midwest, maybe Michigan. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what state he was from, but he's absolutely convinced that quickly clamping and cutting the cord is a horrible disservice to our babies. It, it, he said it, it, our babies are then born phlebotomized. Wow. Which wow. Means to take blood away from. Mm -hmm. And he said, the baby needs their full component of cord blood. Yeah, and that is um, that research is easy to find. It's it's undeniable, and it's not up for questioning. And, and not only that, but not cutting the cord cuts down on infections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because occasionally, you know, the 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 placement gets uh, infected, or the 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 the. Um, uh, the cut site gets infected and, you know, can lead to sepsis and that's not good. Okay. And so um, it was uh, Michelle O'Donnell, I think, who had an article in one of the medical journals um, saying that it's a good idea not to 
cut the cord at all, but he was doing it from an, uh, an infection point of view. Okay. okay. Um, and this other doctor was doing it from um, the brain needs all the blood and all the oxygenated blood that is available to him or her because the oxygenated blood helps organize the brain in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. This doctor thinks that um, quickly clamping and cutting the cord may have some relationship to a lot of the brain problems that our young people are having. Yeah. Oh. And, you know, the diagnoses of um, uh, oh, ADHD yeah. and um, Asperger's and on the spectrum and all those things. Yep. No, I'm not saying it is or not, but I think it's just good and fair and kind to give the baby all of their blood. Yeah. I'm also opposed to uh, banking blood instead of letting the baby have it mm -hmm. because that's a huge expense and um the, the best place for the blood is in the baby's body. Yeah, good. All right, well, let's, um, okay. Uh, hi, Cassandra Cross is here and Aubrey Erickson, hi. Cassandra says, my mother-in-law was told in 1950 that she couldn't have children because she had an in infantile, infantile uterus. She got pregnant three times, the third of whom was my husband. Each time she got pregnant, her doctor went into a panic and said that she just had to have a section so that poor woman endured three C-sections because of an infantile uterus. So as we're talking, one thing women can do to make a change is to research, get knowledge, find out about things, ask. You see, women need and to- in 1950, we didn't have a lot of the resources to ask questions. Plus it was considered impolite. Yeah. Uh, but just, just based on her own understanding of how her body is working and the laws of the universe, she could say, well, even if I have an infantile uterus, was it? Right. It seems to be working okay, so I'm gonna go with that. Right. I mean, she could have just used her own common sense to say, you know what, this doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to show up with reams and reams of research mm -hmm. to say, you know, this just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And point. so I, I encourage people, instead of laboriously looking for every medical journal article to, you know, shove in front of their doctor's faces, just to say, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And and oftentimes doctors, uh, they are making predictions that just aren't true. And we're having someone write in, and I'm just thinking of many women I know, oh, the doctor said I need a C-section because my baby's going to be big. And the baby's born and it's small. And I said to my friend, your baby was only seven pounds and everything was fine. So now are you going to have a conversation with your doctor that you didn't need the C-section? Oh, no, no. You know, she doesn't want to make waves. Right, right. She wants to be polite. The baby, she's happy with the baby. Mm -hmm. So if any of our viewers here have any statistics on the percentage of women who breastfeed, please type it in and share it with us. These numbers can probably be found easier. But I'm very curious to know if anybody keeps statistics, women who breastfeed the baby from age zero to six weeks who do it up to a year, beyond a year. I'd love to know how, if there's any numbers that have been gathered now versus maybe 20 or 30 years ago. So I know that they're probably out there somewhere. Maybe if anybody watching can just kind of let us know so we can, you know, maybe discuss that. But um, why aren't more people breastfeeding? Uh, let me get back to, um, I lost my train of thought, you know, when you went to your question, but what was the uh, woman's comment? About about the 1950, the husband, the infantile uterus or the other woman? I didn't read the it. Other, the, other, the other woman. Basically that you were told you were going to have uh, a seven pound. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. What happens, what happens then is, oh, you really think my baby is going to be big? And the doctor says, yeah. And he says, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't lay down on my back to give birth then because no no mammal, 
No animal lays down on their back to give birth. Nobody. They either stand or they squat or they lay on their side. Nobody lays on their back because when you're laying on your back, you're actually pushing the baby out uphill. Not only that, but um, I don't know if, but when when our legs are spread into the stirrups, yep. it actually makes the pelvic opening smaller. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, it's this levering action. Okay. Um, one of the ways to open a pelvis is to to have something up here and to to let your body hang. That that will open the pelvis. But gravity is our friend. Mm -hmm. And if the baby is expected to be a large baby, it's really, really important to use gravity to help make the birth easier and safer. If gravity doesn't work, we can always do the cesarean section. Um, there was, and I don't know if this was a spoof or if it was real. I'll have to look it up again. I have so many pieces of memory of all the, the um, information that I got for 30 years, and then I lost all my paperwork um, with the flood. But there was something called an obstetrical cyclotron. Mm. And the woman was put in the, the, the middle of this, like, centrifuge, and she was spun around really fast so the baby would just shoot out. And they had a net, of course, to catch the baby as the centrifugal force forced the baby out. Of course, the obstetrical cyclotron um, understands the, uh, uh, the, that the baby will come out the easiest way possible. The baby, you know, cooperates and moves and the hips move and adjust and the pelvic pelvis moves and adjusts. But uh, gravity is far less expensive to use than a mechanical device called the obstetrical cyclotron. Okay. So there was, there was uh, some understanding, you know, that if the force was great enough, the baby would pop out, but they simply ignored, you know, that gravity is a force that, there's a law of gravity that nobody can break. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, are you ready to move on to our topic? Yeah. Children learn what they live. Yes. All right, we have a poem. I don't know if you wanted to read the poem. I'll but... read the first part. Okay. If children, oh, this is called Children Learn What They Live, and the author is Dorothy Lowe Nolte, N-O-L-T-E. Mm -hmm. And I received this during oh, my... Posted it on my Facebook page. I posted okay. on my Facebook page okay. too. It's um, easy to look up. Compliments of Ross Laboratory. Which and I've criticized them with much enthusiasm in previous uh, podcasts. And so now I'll give them credit for um, something good <laughs> providing this to new parents. Yeah. Um, if children live with cri criticism, they learn to condemn. Um, if we criticize and criticize and criticize, our children learn that if something untoward happens, then the best way to deal with it is to criticize another person mm -hmm. and or, or, or even um, be critical of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, if children live with hostility, they learn to fight. Mm -hmm. um, if one of the major functions in the family life is harsh discipline, the children learn that hitting and fighting is the way to solve problems. Now, uh, I don't remember a whole lot of spanking when I grew up. I had uh, four brothers and sisters. There were five kids, grew up on a farm um, in uh, central North Dakota, south central North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember much about spanking. I know that we were spanked, but I don't remember one much about it, except for two, two incidents. Uh, one was um, my mom received a phone call from a neighbor, and the neighbors, it was a Sunday afternoon, uh, the neighbor was inviting themselves over, them and their family. And my mom said, oh, that would be great. You know, we'd love to see you. And I said, no, 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 we're going to grandpa's because that was a plan. Yeah. It was to go to grandpa's and I wanted to go to grandpa's, but my mom accepted um, 
you know, that that uh, the, the the neighbors inviting themselves over. OK. And my dad looked at me like, you know, I've just embarrassed somebody and, you know, I wasn't supposed to yell out, but we're going to grandpa's. Yeah. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I ran out of the house mm -hmm. and um, I hid behind the lilac bush. <laughs> And I was peering uh, around uh, the leaves to see, you know, if if he was coming after me. And that fast, he grabbed my arm and pulled me up and spanked me. Mm -hmm. And years later, I said to my dad, I said, you remember that time that you spanked me because I told the truth? I said we were going to, our plan was to go to grandpa's. And he said, yeah, I remember that. And then he said, I was wrong. I shouldn't have spanked you for that. Mm. So the only spankings that I remember are the ones that were not fair. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, and there was a time with my mom where it was the middle of winter and the glass was all frosted up. A um, lot of lot of moisture from inside the house and it froze to the window pane and I was scratching it off so I could see outside. And um, my my mom spanked me for smearing up her windows. Okay. And I told my mom years later, I said, you shouldn't have spanked me for that. You know, I was just scraping the frost off the windows. You know, what was going on? And she said, you're right. I shouldn't have spanked you. But I spanked you because grandma, who, who lived in a little house behind us, um, was always uh, pointing out how disruptive and disobedient her children were. And grandma thought that we should be spanked more. Ah. And so she, she spanked me to satisfy grandma. Yeah, yeah. But but the interesting thing was my parents knew. Yeah. They never defended themselves. They 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 didn't make excuses for why they do did that. They they told me why they did it, and they told me now that they know it was wrong. And I know I was spanked other times. I know I was. But I don't remember them because uh, evidently in my mind, there was some kind of fairness or justice involved in that. OK. All right. Good. And the ones that bothered me is when they were unjust. Yeah. And well, I'm glad it was only two times. So that's that's pretty I good. I was spanked more often than that. But I don't remember them because it felt fair to me. Yeah. That yeah. There was okay. a good reason for it. Yeah. yeah. So children learn what they live. It's It's got other things. What else? Yes. Uh, if children live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. Yeah, that's a big one. It's yeah, a big one. And I remember as a child sitting and listening to my dad talking to his farmer friends. Yeah. And they would have this long conversation about, you know, crops and, and cattle and prices and transportation, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would listen carefully. And after about a half hour or so, I would sum up their their conversation, their position mm -hmm. on what it had been that they were discussing. And I was probably six or seven years old. Yeah. And they looked at me like, wow, you know, she she really understands, you know, this conversation that we're having. Yeah. And she's really interested in what we have to say. Mm -hmm. And she seemed to sum it up, you know, um, very, uh, very um, accurately, clearly, mm -hmm, accurately. Yeah. And so I was rewarded for paying attention and being able to sum up things into their simplest terms. Good. And so I think that's one of the reasons I grew up not being shy. Yeah. Is because when I spoke, I was rewarded with their attention, their understanding. If I was wrong, they had no uh, no reason not to tell me that I was wrong. Right. If they disagreed with me, they had no reason not to tell me that they disagreed with me. But their disagreements were relevant, and um, and so were their their. Um, observations that I was paying attention and was able to sum up conversations in a very uh, precise way. And so I grew up not being shy. Good. That's but good. the shyness came upon me years and years later when I was under 
um, the influence of someone who who chose gaslighting as yeah. a control um, mechanism. And I became, uh, I, I uh, gradually uh, doubted myself more and more, uh, doubted my significance, doubted my ability to con contribute. And it, it wore me, it took, took about 35 years to wear me down to the point where I just fell apart. Yeah. And that was when the magazine um, and it is, I, I just couldn't hold it together anymore because I, I just, I knew that I could do it, but the pressure of daily, you know, being, being judged as being inadequate was, uh, you know, it just, it got to me after a while. You're emerging out of your shyness. Oh, go ahead. What? I did hold on for a long time because I was strong. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes I think my strength worked against me because if I hadn't been so strong, I would have probably seen more clearly earlier that there was a problem here. But instead, you know, I kept um, in my in my uh, feeling uh, uh, of my magnificence. I kept thinking that I could fix it. Yeah, and um, there was no paradigm shift in our house. Yeah, except mine when I said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Very good. Very that, good. Was, awesome. that was my paradigm. Awesome. Okay, so um, if children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. Mm, that's a big one. And shame was not, again, a feature of my family's experience. I remember one time I was going to tattle on my brother. And I showed my mom the catalog where he had gone to the women's underwear section mm -hmm. and had drawn little clefts on the panties. Yeah. Where where you know where the vulva is. Yeah. And and actually they were quite accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was bound and determined to get into trouble him into trouble. So I showed my mom what my brother had done. Yeah. And she said, so. Oh, that's good. That's very healthy. You know, that's very healthy. I, I yeah. shame, shame is a horrible thing. Shame can really ruin somebody, a young girl about her body. If you shame your kid, if they're, if they're overweight, or if you, you try to change your child be, being ashamed, you know, shame on you. I, I don't, I didn't grow up with shame and I, my kids didn't. And shame is just a, a very strange one for me. And, and a sad one when I hear of people growing up who were ashamed and they're ashamed. How were you able to grow up Catholic without a huge shame influence? Because oh, well, actually, in my experience actually, is there's a lot of shame in the, the Catholic tradition. Well, basically I, I was born Catholic and loosely raised. It wasn't until I met my husband until I explored more about it. I would say I became more of a practicing Catholic. Oh, so your family, your family was Catholic light. Yeah, it, it was just okay. this is what you were born into, and it didn't mean much. It didn't really okay. mean much. So, so there was no shame um, in his family. I don't know if there was shame, but there was authoritarianism. Uh, his parents, a very, very more stern. Well, um, I think authoritarianism is good, or maybe if, that's not the right if word. It's, if it's used judiciously. Yeah, being the the authority can can bring a child comfort. Yeah, as long as they trust the authority. Yeah, if the authority is not uh, doesn't come from a place of love and kindness and respect. Yeah, then the authority becomes damaging. All right. If we respect the person that we give our authority to, it can be fine. But if we give our authority to someone that does not respect us, it's going to bite us. Then the the word I needed to use um, should have been uh, stern. I don't know what's it starts with a D. Uh, very stern. Very. I don't know. I know it's not despotic. They were very demanding. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. But anyways, okay. Yeah. So what, what else do we have? The next one is. If children live with tolerance, 
they learn to be patient. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and tolerance is I, I'm not I'm not real fond of the word tolerant. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, somebody that um, had a, a a program that was called uh, Teach Tolerance. Yeah. And a, a tolerance assumes a level of sup sup superiority, and we are to be tolerant of those who are not as superior as superior as we are. So just the word tolerance um, is kind of a turnoff for me because it's like, I'm richer than you are, but I'm not going to hold it against you. Right, right. It's a... I'm better looking than you, but you're fine. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, skinnier than you, but um, you can lose weight too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. By being is, is to feel superior yeah. and, and to not generate rage against those who are inferior to us. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with yeah. that assessment. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence, you know, validating your child and um, like authentically, not mm -hmm. you can't be fine with your kids. My, my, my dad with his friends, yeah. they were yeah. not uh putting me up on a chair and applauding me for my tricks right they were genu genuinely uh, uh amused and pleased by my participating in the conversation mm -hmm. and there was another thing that happened which which um gave me a lot of encouragement for the direction that my life went and that is to amuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a so, so um, what class was it? Um, I can't remember the class. Anyway, Dr. Er, uh, Mr. Civarella was a teacher and one of the questions he asked, oh, I think it was social studies. Okay. He said, so what kinds of things are inherited? Mm -hmm. Eye color. Yeah. Hair color, yeah. height. Yeah. I raise my hand and he calls on me and I said, reproduction. <laughs> and he says, what? And I said, if your parents don't have children, chances are you won't either. <laughs> and it took him a moment and he, he just laughed. And then the whole, the whole class laughed. And I thought, you know, this is fun. Yeah. To, to say something that doesn't hurt anybody, to say something that really gets to the to the point of the matter, to, yeah. to give an answer that is the absolute extreme of what's inherited. Yeah. And um, I found that by being a little bit, oh, what's the word? Um, delightful. Yes, no, it's not delightful. Um, um, snarky, saucy. Yeah, a little bit snarky, just just a shade snarky, yeah. but without any ill intent. You know, it, it's yeah. just the best way to learn is to laugh from time to time. That's As one of my friends told me, he said, um, "If if I make love to my partner uh, and we don't laugh, there's something wrong." <laughs> and I thought, well, that's very sweet. That's and very laughter sweet. is so important in a household, especially in times of stress. Um, yes. It's yes. just a good way to try to loosen up and, and be comfortable. Humor helps. And the you. difference between laughing with and laughing at yeah. is the, the individual's own sense of self. Oh, that's very if, good. If I think I'm being laughed at. It's because my sense of self is being compromised and the laughter means they're right. Mm. And that makes me feel bad because they know it and I know it because yeah. I'm not, I'm yeah. not um, a, a very self-assured. Yeah. If I am self-assured and the laughter is at my expense, I will laugh my butt off because yeah. I was so nailed. Yeah. And you it's know, just funny I, and it's true. It yeah. is funny. It's yeah. Not threatening. So, so when, when the laughter is at my expense and it's actually funny, I have to laugh too. Yeah. But if my feelings were hurt because of this whole array of other negative influences, 
then those people are no longer my friend and I can't trust them. Mm -hmm. But if it's someone is going to make, make a joke about me, yeah. um, um, which shows up my shortcomings, mm -hmm. and I go, yeah, you're right. It's because, yeah, I know. Um, one of my nieces uh, calls me, well, that's on Jody. Yeah. You know, when I say something that's a little bit edgy, yeah, that's on Jody. And I go, yeah, it is. <laughs> Everybody should have one. Yeah, yeah. And um, if I bristled at that, then her children, which are my grandnieces, yeah. would go, oh, mom's right. Uh, that's Aunt Jody is not a good thing to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm okay with the um, that's Aunt Jody because uh, one of my nephew's fiance said, after we had a brief conversation, she says to her fiance, my nephew, she says, she's not so bad. Yeah. Because she had been warned about me. Yeah, warned. Um, yeah, warned, yes. Yeah. And she found that I was uh, quite engaging and, you know, somewhat humorous, and she appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was the person who asked me, and I don't know if she asked anyone else, um, she had um, XYZ, you know, go on with her, her pregnancy and her birth, ended up with a cesarean and tiny, 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 tiny baby, a very tiny baby. Mm. And uh, but the baby is doing well. She's 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 a real hoot. She's good. She's uh, really got it together. And um, but when when uh, Tori was oh, a couple of years old, she asked me, "Do you do you think we should have another? You know, we're we're think we're talking about having another baby. But do you think we we should risk it?" And I said, absolutely. Yeah. I said, the chances of this happening again are so remote. Yeah. And so they had another baby and she is a dynamo. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's anyone else that she asked if they would dare do this again, because um, I'm not afraid. Yeah. I'm she not afraid you're of how it like works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think children are wonderful and I think you should have more than one or two, you know, if, if that's your heart's desire. And um, she also knew that since I was, well, that's Aunt Jody, yeah. that anything that I had to say, she didn't have to take personally. Good. And she would know it would be honest, you know, honest feedback. Well, I was, I was, I was telling her what she wanted to hear. Yeah, because if she didn't want to have another baby, she would have never asked the question. Oh, yeah, that's true. So I, simply, that's I simply was agreeing with her. Oh, very good. Very and good. when somebody asks you for your advice and you agree with them, you're almost always right. OK, because they already knew anyways. They're just they're just they looking knew, at the balance. They knew what they wanted and then you give it to them. So, yeah. um, I mean, if she had said, do we dare have another baby? And I would say, or somebody else would say, oh, no, look at what you went through. And, you know, all the, oh, no, you couldn't put yourselves through that again. Yeah. Um, they would not be giving her the answer that she was looking for. Oh, and I God. believe that people know what they want. Yeah. But sometimes they have to hear it from somebody else. And at that point, they can either accept it or reject it. That's that's how you know if what you're doing is right. If I say, uh, should I do this? And someone says, no, you shouldn't. Then right away, my belly disagrees with them. And then I know what's the right thing to do. OK, so uh, how I respond to someone's response to my question lets me know where I'm at on the whole subject. Um, I had many conversations where women would say, should I leave my husband? And I would say, absolutely. Mm. Wow. And uh, I also had the other question, should I stay with my husband? I would say, absolutely. Yeah. Because in their question was the answer that they were seeking. And who am I 
to try to change their mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the situation is, but if they weren't happy with my answer, they would tell me. Yeah. And then it would give me more information about what they really want, mm -hmm. which is, you know, someone else's opinion, which agrees with them. But they're telling me that they don't know what their opinion is. And yeah. actually yeah. maybe their brain doesn't know what it is, but their belly does. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Um, there was there was a um, a situation. I was invited to a birthday party. The guy was uh, refinishing some kind of a sports car, rebuilding it, and he had he was very wealthy, and he had bought all the paint that he needed for uh, painting it platinum, iridescent platinum. Wow. And wow. And, and a uh, a sparkly sky blue. He had bought all the paint, you know, for his car in both those colors, but he couldn't decide. He couldn't decide. So he, he had a couple of panels, um, you know, like door panels, and he painted one with the platinum and one with the sky blue. And he held it in the shade and he held it in the light and he, he wet it down, see what it looked like. I mean, he was trying to decide. And I said, I can help you with that. And he said, okay. And I said, do you have a quarter? And he said, yeah. So he pulled a quarter out of his pocket and I went like this and put on my hand and I said, call it. And he said, um, heads, uh, it's platinum, tails, it's blue. All right. And I did like this, and it was tails. And he said, okay. Wow. Now, if he would have dis been disappointed with the results of the toss, I would have said, that's the practice one. Yeah, best two out of three. or yeah. now, we'll, now we'll do it for real. Yeah. And then if it still wasn't what he wanted, he would say, well, let's try that one more time. Yeah. Because his belly knew what he wanted, okay. but his head couldn't figure it out. Yeah, what a good technique you use. So, so yeah. the, the, the tossing of the co a coin actually bypasses the head and goes directly to your belly. And yeah. you know immediately if you're okay with the toss. That's great. Yeah, that's great. All right. If children live with acceptance, they learn to love. That is the second one on the top. If children live with acceptance, they learn to love. Let's see, we could go, move on. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. And I don't like the word approval. I would like to see affirmation or validation. Sometimes approval has to do with you doing tricks in your I, I would like to see it say if if children live with love they learn, they learn to, like, to like themselves that's good love from the heart and and because approval is almost like I will it's conditional it's like tolerance it's conditional yeah yeah all right, so let's see. But this was written what year? Many years I ago. Don't, I don't know when it was written, but I believe this was given to me in the early to the mid 1970s. Okay, so, so I've had this for a long time. If children live with recognition, they learn it is good to have a goal. You know that that isn't in this one. So you oh, know not, that, not. that that may be the new and improved one. Oh, okay. so I, I like that. Read that again for, for us, please. If children live with recognition. They learn it is good to have a goal. Well, recognition is like tolerance. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, there's a, a little bit of an edge to it. Um, I, 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 uh, I hope that every parent recognizes their child. Recognition also has several meanings. It does. It does. And Recognize uh, you for who you are with your special individuality, skills, and talents. And then if you know, you learn to know what they are, then you can set goals. You can yes, decide yes. a career. And when I was a kid, my goal was not to do dishes. Oh. <laughs> and so I would either go out to the outhouse. We had outdoor plumbing. Uh, I'd either go out to the, the outhouse for uh, a good while and read through catalogs. Uh. Um, by the time I got back, the dishes were done. Um, and as I became a little more astute and more creative, I would sew for my oh. siblings. Okay. And um, I remember making my sister's prom dress 
a lined lace scalped on the bottom, beautifully fitted dress. And um, she was willing to do dishes, you know, as long as I was sewing her dress. And so she, she got to do the dishes and I got to do the sewing and I loved to sew. And so what does your sink look like right now? Some dirty dishes in there? Oh, I washed a week's worth of dirty dishes wow. this morning. Okay. Yeah. How about your sewing? What have you been sewing lately? Um, I have been um, collaborating with my granddaughter. I find odd little things and I say, we can do this with this and we can alter that. And so I've been working with her on that. But the thing that I, um, I really enjoy making are my bags. And um, I'll, I'll show you some of my bags next time. I am a bag lady. I, I make a bag that is on the bias and it's absolutely beautiful. And I use um, uh, repurposed fabric. Mm -hmm. um, actually, yeah. well, I'm not going to get up and go get it, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. Yeah, it's it's a design that I developed. It's all on the bias. It fits close to the body if it's nearly empty. And if you're going on a trip, you can put a week's worth of clothes in it and still call it your purse. Nice. Well, if you know exactly where it is and it only takes you 30 seconds, you can go get it. Yep. Good, because I have a couple things I want to share. I'll finish up the rest of this poem. Okay. If, if children live with sharing, they learn generosity. If children live with honesty, they learn truthfulness. If children live with fairness, they learn justice. If children live with kindness and consideration, they learn respect. If children live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and in those about them. If children live with friendliness, they learn the world is a nice place in which to live. So this is a very nice poem, uh, Children Learn What They Live by Dorothy Law Nolte. And what I want to say is it's so important to work on your marriage and to make a happy marriage because your marriage is their first model. Yes. And, yes. and if their parents can't work together, then they think that when you're adult means you have to hold fast and hard to your own ideas or opinions because if you don't, someone's going to take it away from you. Mm -hmm. And it's not a sharing. It's not a cooperative environment. And um, I'm really happy to say that um, my daughters that are now in their 40s are so giving and so loving and so kind to each other and um and critically important in their communities and do lots of wonderful things um you know starting a, a food distribution site it's a it's a it's a saturday food bank and they just decided that their community needed it and they put pulled it together and it's you know it serves many many families every especially now you know with you know a lot of people having additional difficulties yeah. Um, I just, I really am proud of my girls and it's, it's, uh, somewhat amazing that they're such incredible family, mother, wife, community people when they saw, uh, very little interaction of that quality, um, between their parents. But so, they, knew, they, I bet they knew you had it. You had it in the heart. You did the magazine. They saw, they saw me be very involved in my community. And yeah. you know, I was able to bring people together. Anyway, so. this is one of my bags. You can, um, I chose the striped one so you can see that it's. it's um, nice I have a white one. I really like it. There's a, it's very roomy. Yeah, I, I made you and your girls uh, some a long time ago, didn't I? Or was that somebody else? Definitely, else? probably just me, but I love it. I used it. I went on a cruise and um, in January, and I needed, it was white. You made me a white one, and it fit right in with what I was doing, and it yeah, carries. This is, this is the one that I, I take with me. I have to have my colostomy supplies and, you know, lots of other stuff. So yeah. I, wish, I wish this was uh, back farther, but... Um, this is this is my everyday bag, and it was made from a valance. 
Oh, you know, wow. the, the top part of your curtains. Right. And um, I love the color. And the other thing that I've been sewing is um, face masks. Oh, yeah. Covers. That's great. And I like repurposing things. So I found this. It's a okay. little Batman cape. Yeah. And I am going to make a Batman mask for one of my, I mean, isn't that going to be cuter cute. than the Yeah, that's yeah. going to be cute. And um, my favorite color is iridescent. Mm -hmm. And I love anything that sparkles. My grandkids tease me. They say, oh, they see me bending over. And they say, oh, grandma just found something shiny. <laughs> <laughs> Because any, anytime I find something shiny, you know, it's usually a coin or something, and I always pick it up. Oh, Grandma Grandma found something shiny, and I don't know if you can see the sparkles on here, but it's, it's a little pair of, of um, worn-out um, uh, little people's pants, and I'm going to make yeah, that's a, cute. a shiny fuchsia uh, face mask for myself out of that. That's and um, I, I love being creative. But mostly, I love doing things with and for other people. And those values definitely translated down to your children, and it probably will to the I, grandchildren. I believe so. I believe so. Yeah. Their father also was very generous with his time, um, you know, with the things that he was interested. So they saw that also. Good. Um, but um, as as it is apparent to me now, I was married to two people. I was married to a really fine. Um, almost like a renaissance man. Mm -hmm. And I was also married to to somebody else that um, I um, wasn't able to get along with very well. And I was yeah. never sure, you know, who was going to pop up. Yeah. Anyway. Um, well, our time has run out. I want to thank you so much. It's been a good conversation. Children learn what they live and we, we model behavior for them and, and values and even when you don't think you're looking, you are the example that you're setting for your children, your family. Um, I want to close out with one more um, little uh, prop that okay. I used in my presentation with, with the doctors. And of course, this is for suctioning out the mouth and the nose of a little person. Okay. And they don't need this. They don't need this. They, they get their stuff out just fine and uh, uh, this can damage their their throat um their their nostrils and their throat are very sensitive you know putting this in and repeatedly and sucking stuff out if the baby does need to be suctioned mm -hmm. the proper person to do the suctioning is the mother yeah she places her mouth over the mouth and nose of the baby sucks out the mucus spits it out and this is such a wonderful thing to do because it colonizes the baby with her organisms. Great. Which is absolutely vital. If she um, isn't available or, or doesn't want to or can't do it, then the father mm -hmm. uh, will step in and do this because there's, there's a familiarity in the colonization there as well. So this is also an apparatus that... Um, um, needs to be questioned. Very good. All right. Thank you so much, Jody McLaughlin. We'll see you next time. And remember, question everything. Question everything. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you.